What's up fish friends, it's Alex here, your friendly reef dog. And today I'm gonna to give you an update on the Red Sea Reefer Peninsula 500. Now I'm doing this update because I've had loads of requests and comments asking for it from you guys, my subscribers. So no messing around today, let's get straight into it. Now in the last video I was telling you I wasn't particularly pleased with the, how the left hand bommie was looking and I just added a Falco hawkfish that goes in with my long nose and scarlet hawkfish as well. I'd also bought a tailspot blenny to go in with my Midas blenny and he'd been in for a day or two. Since then I've added a couple of really nice corals on the left hand bommie that will really brighten it up. There are two pink and green hyacinthus type corals that will really spread out and grow. You probably can't see them that well at the moment but when these guys bush out they will look fantastic and we'll add a little bit of variety to that bommie. And on the right side, I've added a couple of really nice SPS corals as well. We're still looking a little bit samey in terms of the color over here, but there is enough variety. And when they all spread out, they will look fantastic. At the moment, if anything, my biggest problem on this side is keeping some of the bigger corals trimmed back as they are starting to take over a little bit, particularly the birds of Paradise Gattatus, which I said I'd remove in a previous video, and I'm still weighing up whether I should do so. And of course I've got another green staghorn type coral that is really starting to spread and needs a bit of bonsai work. The Falco hawkfish then is doing really well. When I first put him in, there was a little bit of argy-bargy between him and the long-nose hawkfish. The long-nose would come over and chase him away every time he sat still, but there was no real aggression and it didn't seem to be a problem and that all died away after about a week and since then they all seem to get on fine. I still regularly see the long-nose and the flame hawkfish together, but I never really see the Falco hawkfish joining the party, so I guess he's not mates with them yet. Now I've had the long nose and the flame in together for about 18 months and they've been absolutely fine, but it remains to be seen how they will all do in the long term. Unfortunately though, the tail spot blenny I added died after about a week or two. Now when I first put him in, my Midas blenny would chase him away a little bit when he got too close to some of his favorite hiding spots, but that seemed to die off when the tail spot set himself up in his favorite little spot. But with that being said, he didn't ever really compete with food when I put frozen or pellets in, and I think he might have wasted away and died but he also could have been battered by the Midas. And I think it's less likely that he was battered by the Midas Blenny, but I don't really know what happened. And I'm not gonna try it again, just in case it was aggression between the two. And while we're talking about dead fish, I've had another Anthias die. Now I had nine of these guys in total when I first started, and they've actually been in for over a year now, but I have now had two die. As far as Anthias go, these are about as peaceful as they come. They don't really seem to bicker and they eat food quite readily. But with that being said, even these guys do bicker a little bit and I think that is most likely the cause of death for the two that I've lost so far. There's a distinct hierarchy with these fish, which means there's always one jostling to be the king of the bunch. And in my last video, I also told you that I had quite high phosphate and that I wasn't planning on doing anything to reduce it. But I eventually decided to see what would happen if I put some Roophos in. Now I did that about a month ago and I haven't actually tested my phosphate since then, but I can be pretty certain that it has dropped. I'm not sure I've noticed any particular difference in the color or growth rates of my corals. With the exception of this guy, that is starting to lose a little bit of color. Now it's not necessarily the phosphate that's doing that, but that's the only major change I've made recently, so I think it probably is. And for that reason, I've taken the phosphate reactor offline with the intention of getting everything back to how it was before. But I'm currently toying with the idea of getting a better UFO grow lamp for my Cheeto. At the moment, I have a Tunzi light that's only about 11 watts, and while it does grow Cheeto slowly, it doesn't grow that fast, and I do wonder if my phosphate would be kept under control a lot better if I had a more powerful light. So I'm currently looking at the AI fuge light which is four times as powerful as my current light it's also adjustable which means i can tinker with it if it gets a little bit too strong but i haven't decided if i'm going to go ahead and do that yet brs tv have done loads of videos about how great refugiums can be for controlling nitrate and phosphate and while i've always had refugiums i've never gone all in on a really good light and i'm a little bit skeptical as to whether or not it'll make the difference that i'm after so i might just stick with what i've got given that everything else is doing pretty well. While Roophos is absolutely fantastic at removing phosphate, it doesn't do so particularly smoothly, and even when you put in a tiny amount, it strips out pretty much everything there is. So I do wonder if having a really good fuge would smooth out the phosphate reduction a little bit more. One of my Goniopora corals has also been sulking since I reduced phosphate. Now, Gonies are pretty tricky to keep anyway, so it might not necessarily be the phosphate level, but I'm gonna keep an eye on that and see if it perks up when the phosphate starts to creep up again. And now I'm gonna tell you about the near disaster I had. And this genuinely could have wiped out my entire coral stock. 
I bagged up a coral to sell to someone, and I went to replace that in my sump with half a litre of premix salt water. However, I keep my premix salt water in the same containers as I keep my calcium and alkalinity solutions, and I accidentally poured half a litre of alkalinity into my sump. Now, fortunately, I noticed my mistake immediately as the water went cloudy, which told me that I'd used alkalinity instead of salt water. So I instantly turned my return pump off, and fortunately, none of it escaped into my display tank. And to give you an idea of just how much of a disaster it would have been, the alkalinity level in my display tank was 7 dKH, and I tested my sump dKH after I'd poured half a litre in there, and it was sitting at almost 13. Now, a swing of 6 dKH would almost certainly have wiped out most, if not all, of my corals, so I got really lucky there, and it was great that I managed to react in time to turn the return pump off but it did cost me an entire day of mixing up enough salt water to drain the entire sump and fill it back up again with water that was the same alkalinity as my display tank. But back to good stuff then, I have added a couple more fish. Firstly, I've added a scarlet dragonette. Now I absolutely love mandarins and scutablennies, but I've never quite been brave enough to add one to this tank because I have a number of rats in my tank that probably eat most of the little pods that the Scarlet Dragonette will need to live. But given this tank is now established with a thriving refugium that is completely covered in copepods and amphipods, I figured it would be worth a shot and that he's got as good a chance in my tank as anywhere else. It's still early days, but he doesn't look like he's lost any weight at all and he seems to be pretty happy and it's an absolutely stunning fish. Now I can't stress strongly enough that you should not get one of these unless you have a very well established tank and even then there's every chance it will wither and die which is really sad to watch. So don't take this as a sign of success, I'll wait till I've had him for a good six months before I give you feedback. And some of you will have seen that I've just put out a video about removing Aptasia and the reason I did that is because I discovered Aptasia in my tank. Now I was really chuffed with myself for having no Aptasia whatsoever in this tank, I set up with all dry rock, I was really careful with the Cheeto I added and I've inspected every coral I've bought very carefully to make sure there's nothing nasty on it. But then I saw this bad boy and that all went away. Now as you will have seen from the video I did on Aptasia, I think the best way to get rid of it is to use Aptasia X to kill it and then put in some peppermint shrimp to clean up the rest. I've had success with that method before and I've never had problems with the peppermint shrimp eating corals. But against my better judgment this time I have gone for a copper banded butterfly. Now I can't tell you how much of a bad idea this is. Copper bands have a very poor survival rate and I have tried with a couple in previous tanks only for them to die after a couple of months. And even if this guy does survive there's a good chance that he'll go for my favourite acans. So I may have to take action to remove them and try to sell them. But I just couldn't resist and I managed to find one in my local fish shop that was really hungrily eating frozen food, so I decided to take the plunge. Now he's only been in a couple of weeks, but he already competes for food and eats anything frozen that I put in the tank. He hasn't as yet touched the Aptasia, but I would expect him to have a bedding in period of at least a few weeks before he figures that out. And the main one I've got is quite a big Aptasia, so he might not even eat that anyway, and I might need to get some Aptasia X to sort it out myself. Now, as you would have seen, I have a purple tang, and tangs, of course, are aggressive. So when I first put the copper band in, he got a bit of a Glasgow welcome from the tang. At first, it was just posturing and showing the copper band who's boss, but after an hour or two, it became apparent that he wasn't going to leave him alone, and he started trying to batter him and chase the copper band around the tank. So I quickly grabbed my shaving mirror and stuck it to the side of the tank, and suddenly the purple tang decided it was more important to fight off his reflection than batter the copper band. I tried taking the mirror away after a couple of days, but the purple tang went straight back for the copper band, so I had to leave it in place for a week in the end. So if you have any aggressive fish in your tank, it is well worth keeping a small mirror handy for situations like this. I've also added two really cool shrimp. They're harlequin shrimp and they only eat starfish. Now I've had an outbreak of Asterina starfish recently. For the first few months it didn't really bother me, but in the end I got a bit fed up with them and decided to do something to reduce their numbers. It also helps that harlequin shrimp are a really quirky and cool invert that I've never kept before, so I wanted to give it a bash. Now it's very difficult to catch these guys on film. There are two of them in the tank, but they very rarely come out other than at night and they tend to spend the day in their cave. I was a little bit nervous with these guys given that I've got an army of reasonable sized rasses and of course three hawkfish. Harlequin shrimp are a little bit delicate and are exactly the sort of shrimp I would expect my fish to go for. But he's been in there for a couple of months now and the rasses and hawks have left him alone completely which means he can work through the night to get rid of my Asterina starfish. However I did get flatworms on my Parites coral. It's a really strange one because they didn't spread to any other coral whatsoever and I went back to the shop where I bought the Parites and every other frag they had had the same flatworms on it. 
yet none of their other cars had flatworms on them at all. So I guess a Parietes coral must be particularly comfortable for this species of flatworm. In any event, I dipped the frag which killed off all the flatworms, and they've been gone ever since. Although I was disappointed that my rasses didn't touch any of them, because that's one of the main reasons they're in there in the first place. And finally we move on to equipment. Until recently I've had a 3 foot hybrid light above my tank. It's a Giesman Stella with a Kessel AP700 and a Kessel A360 in the middle. But I always found that there wasn't enough light at the far ends of my tank, so I've been after a 4 foot unit for a long time. You probably won't be able to see much difference on camera, but the outer 6 inches of both ends of the tank look much brighter to me now, so I'm really happy. The only downside is that I feel like I need two AP700s in the middle, rather than one 360, so this is a classic example of upgrade knock-on effect. So I'm pleased to say overall everything is doing really well, my fish are getting on great guns, my cars are looking really bright and colourful, and are growing at a decent rate too. But in this hobby there is always a disaster waiting to happen, so I have no intention of taking my eye off the ball, and I wouldn't say for one moment that this tank is starting to look after itself. Now the tank is more or less chock-a-block at the moment, there are a few more spaces for corals, but not many, and I'm pretty much at capacity with fish, so I don't really plan on adding any more livestock unless I come across a really nice coral or two. So what I want from the tank for the next six months is to really settle down, grow out, and let the coral start filling out and taking over the rock work. But the money I'm not going to be investing in coral, I want to invest instead in aquarium control. So I'm going to look at something like a GHL KH director or a Neptune Apex Trident. I test KH at least twice a week and frankly I'm fed up of doing it so I want something to do it for me. And because there probably won't be any big changes in the next six months, I'm not likely to do many more update videos. But I always post my best update photos on Instagram, so follow me at ReefDork if you want to know what's going on. And I'm thinking of doing a video series telling you how I run my tank with everything from lighting intensity and time schedule all the way through to how I control nutrients and phosphate and finishing off with how I monitor and control alkalinity and calcium. But that's all for me. If you enjoyed the video, give me a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll catch you next Friday.